Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Quelques mots d'introduction en français avant la conférence qui se tiendra en anglais. Donc, nous sommes très heureux d'accueillir Brian Ifer pour cette conférence organisée dans le cadre de l'exposition de Zoé Léonard « Al Rio to the River ». Brian Ifer est historienne de l'art, professeur à l'Université College à Londres. Euh, ses recherches s'intéressent en fait à, et se nourrissent d'aller-retour entre les avant-gardes, euh, je crois que c'était le sujet de sa thèse de doctorat, et puis la pratique euh, d'artistes contemporains. Elle a écrit de nombreux livres et des essais importants sur des artistes tels que Eva Essé, Louise Bourgeois, Ronnie Horn, Gabriel Orozco, euh, parmi tant d'autres, ainsi qu'un livre sur l'art des années 50 et 60, intitulé The, The Infinite Line, We're Making Art After Modernism, publié en 2004. Euh, Brian Ifer a également été commissaire d'exposition, notamment de la très belle rétrospective d'Annie Albers, présentée à la Tate Moderne à Londres et au Cavin à Düsseldorf en 2018, avec Anna Coxon et Maria muller charek qui est ici présente. Elle va aujourd'hui nous parler de Zoé Léonard, de cette œuvre magistrale qui est Al Rio to the River, en articulant sa pensée autour de l'idée de la notion de projet. Voilà. Merci. Thank you, Christophe. Uh, bonsoir à tous. Um, it's so extraordinary to be here and actually seeing this exhibition that I've thought so much about over the years and having thought about it, talked about it off and on with Zoe Leonard, but of course never seen it. So to be here, to have the occasion to see the show, but to also to be here at Mudam, I really just want to thank you, Christophe, for the invitation, and also Sarah Bowman for helping me so much, and Bettina Steinbrugger, and, and Suzanne Cotter as well, who, I, who, who asked me in the first place. So I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you. Um, so... This project, I'm going to talk quite closely about this project that you will have seen upstairs. It's a project that's taken Zoe Leonard five years to make. Um, a single work, five years to make it. Um, in its entirety, it consists of 550 photographs, I think. Um, edited down from many thousand, of course. Um, so the labour of making it is just immense. Um, and here at Modam is its first installation, edited down, I think, to about 250 images. Um, and the photographs, as you will have seen, course around uh, the walls like a river with many crucial and um, uneven intervals between the images, which I think is important. So there are flows, there are stops and starts, there are numerous small series within the larger series. And I noticed that in the conversation with Zoe Leonard, um, between Zoe Leonard and Suzanne Cotter, I guess on this very stage, I wish I'd been there. She, Zoe talked about, she said the words flow, the, she wanted to flow the photographs through the wall architecture. Um, and that's exactly, I think, what does happen. Like the great course of the Rio Grande, the river the work follows along the Mexican-US border to the Gulf of Mexico, where it enters the sea. Of course, the Rio Grande is a river with politics embedded in it, and never more explosively so than when Zoe Leonard was making this work during the Trump years. And those politics are certainly inscribed in the work, not simply as a subject matter, um, but in complex ways, I think, and ways that I'd like to explore this evening. So I just want to actually begin with the basic structure of the work. 
So the first part of the work, Zoe Leonard calls the prologue. Um, it's been seen before um, when it was exhibited at the Carnegie International in 2008 in 2018, but now it's shown obviously very differently and really acts as a prologue, like a literary prologue. Um, and it's as if it's preparing us for the rest. Um, and it consists of a suite of photographs that's also quite distinct, as you'll have noticed from the rest. Um, these are passages of water water that moves, water that eddies, water that swells, and water that in the photographs almost appears to congeal or petrify um, on the surface. There's, a, there's almost um, an opaque thickness to the water. And for the viewer, as we begin with the prologue, and as we begin to look, we kind of hover just above the water. And these close-ups on the swell intensify the sense of the water's opacity, um, but also the water's momentum. As in a prologue, um, this is a kind of prequel and differentiated from the main body of the work. And as we adjust, it becomes clearer that they are in color, kind of in color. They're a very murky brown, but they're, um, they're shot in color that verges on gray. Um, the prologue sets up a, a dialogue then between the immensity of this river and these small sections of it, patches of the river almost. So a dynamic between the continuous flow and the photographs which stop it and still it and become this strange material surface that's almost like a strange kind of miniature landscape, I feel. It sets up to the dynamic of proximity, closeness, and distance that will structurally drive uh, the whole thing. But it's also an essential part of this tripartite form on the one hand, and essential to the idea of the kind of project that this is, which I understand, um, I think, as a work in the making. Um, which relates to the artist's processes of making it on the one hand, but also the temporal and other kinds of demands that it makes on us as viewers as we are viewing it. So each section, after all, is a kind of condensation of a period of time, but also a passage of time that unfolds in the seeing of it. Um, so in the main body of the work, we follow the course of the river on its epic journey as it travels to the Gulf of Mexico. So note the dramatic shift to the horizontal format and to the horizon that provides a long uh, lateral discontinuous flow throughout the work, always broken, um, but always moving inexorably on um, until it doesn't and it becomes the sea, you know. So this formal imperative um, and the format are very self-reflexive and kind of self-mimicking, I think. I feel that resonates with Roland Barthes' description of what he thinks a project is. In one of his final lecture series called The Preparation of the Novel, he talks about what he thinks a project is and the work that the project will would ultimately become as what he said it calls a maquette of its own making um, which in the process exposes the techniques of the apparatus that made it there's a lot of that i think in in zoe leonard's project then the final part of course the small part the coda at the end 
sorry, this is <laughs> the Gulf of Mexico. So that last part, the coda, she switches apparatus or camera type. These digital prints, actually, they're in color, of course, are taken on an iPhone of a computer screen, her computer screen. And they're very clearly differentiated. You know, you can see the marginalia of the screen, um, the bottom edge on the left. You know, this is a, an image that's manifestly mediated through the digital screen. So it's a way of kind of dissipating the fantasy of a climactic endpoint to the to the project, I think, that might be the waves crashing on the beach of the Gulf of Mexico. So instead it's a, a way of almost perhaps echoing or reworking those aerial views of the prologue you know, where you hover, the camera hovers over the water. But here in this found footage taken from surveillance cameras on um, the bridge across the river, um, you also have this kind of looking down. So there's a kind of echoing there. So in basically, this is a project, I want to stress, in three parts, each of which uses... A different process. So the prologue, the prologue is made up of coloured sea prints. Then the main body of the work, there are these miraculous um, black and white hand printed silver gelatin photographs. That's the main narrative. And then these digital prints in the coda. So I think also not just different techniques, but this tripart structure, in each of those parts, they invite a different <coughs> mode of attention, perhaps, from us. They kind of orientate us differently in relation to the world. So my question in relation to that structure is what it might be to think of an epic form now and how the Al Rio project as a project relates to a history of images and situate us, situates us as viewers in relation to it. And what's the measure? I want to ask what the measure is of such a long drawn out project understood in the sense of how long it made to make it, and the rhythms of its installation, and the overlapping temporalities that this project embodies. It's live, of course, in, um, in the sense that we can see the word on the screen. But of course, it's not live at all, in the sense, except in the sense that it was live when the artist grabbed that image. And all along, the matter of surveillance, not only of looking, but of being looked at, of surveying and being surveyed, is not just clear, um, but as, of course, surveillance is inescapable, um, a given, a precondition. So I'm trying to stress from the outside, from the outset, I want to really insist on the fact that the form the work takes mimics and acts out the course of the river. That's to say the course of the project and the course of the Rio Grande sort of simulate and are entangled with one another, even when the river itself isn't visible, which very often it is not. The work has a pace which is less the pace of the water, but ours, you know, as we follow it um, and as it meanders along and around the wall architecture. Not always, of course, but mainly pictures in a landscape format with that horizon line that's constantly present, but also constantly shifting. And of course, the, the camera too is directed not only at the water or even the river, but the banks to the side of it, the infrastructure, the land the river passes through, the sky, much of which is 
desert, but much of it is farmed and ploughed as here. Much of it is militarised, which touches on the way people live. Lives are led on the lands adjacent to it, and particularly on both sides of that Mexican border, but also draws attention to the migrations that cross it of both people and birds and the precarity of that relationship between multiple cultures and multiple landscapes. So the project is about much more than the water, but the water is what keeps it moving on. Its edges, its banks, its infrastructure, the urbanization, as much as the landscape, are part of the life of this river, just as the river is part of the lives of the people who live alongside it or want to cross it and the birds that pay no attention to a border between nation states. The temporality of seasonal change, I think, is there too. The bloom of the desert in flower, for example, in um, this small group of coloured uh, photographs and there are other passages at night. We pass through different times of day. On occasions, it's a bit like a clock, seeing the light fade through the dark. Um, but in this little series, there's something quite myopic in this sudden attention to the small. Um, the sudden looking down at the floor of the desert in this series as it literally blooms into colour. There's something about the orientation of the look, the looking down as you hike. And Zoe Leonard is a hiker um, at the desert floor that is, of course, full rather than empty. And having spent long periods of time, especially during the pandemic and the making of this work in Marfa, Texas, I think its subject is clearly rooted there and in the politics of the border that's omnipresent there. Um, its politics then are not only the politics of, of the Trump years during which it was made, but also, I think, the fragility of nature at a time of planetary and climate crisis. This intimate knowledge of that place that you can have when you walk in it, when you walk in this landscape, reminds me of Via Selman's work. There's a work she made at the end of the 1970s called To Fix in the Memory. And she took several years to complete it. So she collected these stones on her walks, Selmin's, her walks along the Rio Grande, in fact, and then cast them in bronze and then painted them so as to make these kind of indistinguishable trompe l'oeil doubles of the natural stones. Or another artist that comes to mind here is Agnes Martin, who was also an artist with an intimate knowledge of a desert landscape. This is uh, Agnes Martin's film, one of only two films that she made. This is from 1976, and it was a, a 16 mil film, a strange film that she made following a 10-year-old boy as he wanders through the New Mexico landscape where she lived and which begins at the water's edge. I'm also reminded of Agnes Martin because Agnes Martin took a couple of years after a long trip up the Mackenzie River in Canada, and this is an image of her taken by Donald Woodman, this rather arduous journey um, that she made. But there's something about an aesthetic or a poetics of a journey as Martin or Leonard moves through the landscape that resonates, I feel, um, as well as that sense that Zoe Leonard certainly also has of emptying out uh, the superfluous, this insistent frontality, you know, front-facingness that she insists on so often. Um, 
the way El Rio is both very immersive um, and seems so very often to block vision and kind of keep us out. Um, well, and I'll talk in a moment about the way the Rio Grande project establishes a very complex relationship, I think, to the history of photography. I don't want to underestimate that. But I want to point first to what I feel is an important sense, sensibility that Leonard has um, that's connected to certain forms of abstraction, often serial, but also of the kind of abstraction that we might associate with Agnes Martin. This is, of course, not the first time that Zoe Leonard has made work that touches on questions of scale, um, or that looks like landscape, or, my, or that's concerned with migrations. Um, they, these have often been drivers of her work in earlier series like Analog, the project that started with the shop fronts of the Lower East Side and end up in Cuba and Africa, um, tracking the continental drift of uh, the garment industry, or you see I'm here after all, a work that consisted of 4,000 vintage postcards of the Niagara Falls. And so I just want to keep in mind the sheer scale of the Al Rio project as a project. Um, just as analog was organized into chapters, so the structure of Al Rio takes on not just a, a shape or expansive mode, but works with the space that it's in. And there's something, I think, incredibly rigorous and very sculptural about the way Zoe Leonard works that resonates for me, anyhow, much more with the kind of blocking and building that we might also associate with a conceptual artist like Hannah Darboven. I'll come back to Darboven's sort of vast installations later. But first, let me just go back to square one again, if I may, to think about how Zoe Leonard works with landscape. And landscape as a pictorial mode and as a repository of conventions. And the way her lens is always mediated by and sometimes very explicitly in conversation with the history of photography. And over the course of hundreds of photographs, she also lays out, of course, numerous possible ways of photographing a landscape um, that's deeply embedded in that history. The river receding like train tracks through to the horizon um, or flowing through gorges and rocky landscapes, as you can see in this sequence. So the river has a complex history, but so do its representations. And the history of settlement in the United States is historically embedded and inextricably linked to its representations, especially vividly in the work of uh, photographers like uh, Timothy Sul O'Sullivan, for example. Sorry, this is... Uh, Zoe, and this is um, O'Sullivan, who began to take photographs in the Civil War in the 1860s and who was part of the expeditionary forces making geological surveys and mapping the country as it expanded westward. So partly this idea of an epic journey reaches back to the idea of the expedition and these great surveys, pointing to pictures like this taken by O'Sullivan during his years with the Wheeler expedition surveying the 100th meridian. This is 1871. So trying to get at this association to the expedition and the survey and its relationship to present day surveillance, implicit rather than explicit within Zoe Leonard's project. Likewise, 
there are these amazing uh, and uh, photographs by O'Sullivan where he includes the measure in some of the photographs, you know, measuring a rock ex um, the rock inscriptions in, in the landscape like this one. Zoe Leonard doesn't include a measure of this kind, but my question, what is the measure of the work, I think turns out to force us to, to think rather differently about how we measure these relations. But it's these temporal and historical confluences, or are they divergences, that I'm particularly interested in, especially the way this project puts pressure on what we know or what we can know about a river, about land, about water. Thinking about the scale of the project, not in terms of how big it is, or not simply how big it is, but in terms of its measure. You know, how do we measure it? By how long it is or how old it is? Or what does it mean to ask about the time scale of a river? We could think of this as the American epic mode, even more so than perhaps the later Ansel Adams' um, famous images of Yosemite. I'm thinking about this kind of monumental landscape. This is O'Sullivan again, um, where you can see it's almost like a kind of classical temple carved out of the rocks. This has been much discussed by photo photography historians, but as a geological survey, of course, it's meticulously documented in terms of precise place, date, where the camera is, whether it looks up or down uh, into the canyon. These were part of uh, the portfolio on the Colorado River, and this one, you know, the title... Um, looking across the Colorado River to, to the mouth of Pariah Creek. So I think we need to distinguish here, perhaps, between the monumental and the epic. And within the epic, we need to distinguish several different versions of that concept, maybe. Zoe Leonard has used herself the word epic to describe the project. And I think there's room to think about the epic as distinct and different from the monumental and classicizing even lens of O'Sullivan. Take the use of repetition as one of several strategies that deflate this soaring vertical axis, you know, the soaring canyons or cliffs of that Colorado River series that I just showed you her insistent flattening to the horizon, the insistent lateral direction. This is a relation of, you know, side by side, metonymy, if you like, or adjacence that's sustained through the project as kind of insistent pulse. When um, Walter Benjamin wrote about Brecht's epic theatre of the 1920s, he thought of it as a project of a product rather sorry of the historical imagination in which brecht was often reworking familiar say shakespearean tropes um, but reworking them as a, an experiment in whether a historical event and its literary treatment might be made to turn out differently or at least be viewed differently if the processes of history were re-evaluated. So I'm interested in, then in this idea of reworking and so re-evaluating the processes of history. Um, it's a way of thinking about Zoe Leonard's embedding of historical references into her images, as I say, not necessarily directly and sometimes very tangentially, but it's sometimes hard not to see the presence of a particular photographer or another. Often, for me at least, the looming um, presence of Dorothea Lang, Lang, whose work seems to loom large in Zoe Leonard's scenography. Um, 
not least in this work. This is the church on the horizon beyond the furrowed field, an image taken in Texas on the American side. Um, but the way it invokes, at least in memory, or seems to remember, you know, one image remembering another, the famous image of Dorothea Lange's tractored out from 1938, this iconic image that was taken in Childress County, Texas. Um, it was the same year that Dorothea Lang um, took that very famous photograph of the Highway 70 in the, the new... No, the, the, sorry, I'm muddling myself. Um, it was the same year that she took um, a photograph of Highway 70 in um, the New Mexico desert, and it's very reminiscent of that very famous, very iconic, the Road West, um, that's a very well-known photograph. But these are the years when she's working for the Farm Security Administration, um, the years of the Great Depression. She's documenting the lives of migrant workers and their families heading west to California. And she photographed many versions of roads like this one without need of anything but this empty road extending into the distance. Um, you know, the route many refugees cross was stipulated in the title. So this idea of re-evaluation or reworking then is not so much, I want to suggest, a, a matter of influence, so much as a, a critical engagement with the image and with a certain body of historical imagery. Um, I think you can think of it in terms of, um, well, I would invoke the, the word chronotope, this idea of a kind of space space-time, kind of cipher of temporality as well as spatiality. So marking a historical ref relationship between two images. And I don't only mean Lang's present because of these famous images, but something perhaps more substantive as well about the politics of seeing that Lang's work brings to the fore. Um, the drive to map the country as a terrain of migrations, privations, and economic displacement. I want to be careful how I describe this relationship, and I'm using that word chronotope to describe not merely the recursive or repetitive motif or image, but the historical shortfall, perhaps, or or temporal relation, which is a divergence as much as a confluence. Zoe Leonard lays out a series of possibilities within landscape photography. And, you know, I am not a, a historian of American photography. And I, as I say, I don't think the point is to pick out her influences. But nonetheless, there are these moments within the project that seem to indicate that relationship. Uh, for example, here, can they help but remind us of the picket fences of Paul Strand? Um, that then, within Zoe Leonard's project, becomes this kind of recursive sign that mutates into the militarized version of the, the border wall seen behind it as a, at, at a distance and then kind of mutates into the concrete spikes of the border wall. Maybe the point is that it's impossible not to invoke such historical precedents against which our historical present also has to be measured or is measured. So I'm trying to stress not sources or influences, but could we think of it instead as a kind of layering of representations through which any attempt to map the Rio Grande and the border are historically mediated through? You know, as it were, you might wish it were different, but you can't not, in a way, um, 
be mediated through the history of those representations. And I think that also applies to the idea of the epic itself, the epic form which traditionally invo invokes a journey, whether it's Homer's odyssey of homecoming or Zoe Leonard herself has, has referenced Ahab's you know, great sea voyage in Herman Melville's Moby Dick. But the gr Rio Grande is, of course, for a long stretch a border too, and this intensely fraught and highly militarized border crossing between the U.S., and Mexico, I mean, what interests me, I think, is the intersecting of these different modalities where, for instance, you have the great movement of the riv river, in s especially in the photographs that are shot in perspective that so powerfully invoke the metaphorics of a journey and the mythologies, of course, that attach to that, and then these details that cut across it, like the wall behind that picket fence that I just showed you, or here, uh, the surveillance cameras, or in another, the small patch of white that emerges as a, a patrol car in an otherwise almost pastoral landscape. There's a continually alternating rhythm, that's to say, as we move through the exhibition with shifting demands and shifting modes of attention required of us. Sometimes it's more like a swerve, a sideways move to the looping tracks that run alongside the, the course of the river. There are the kinds of detail or sideways moves the loopings back, the tangents that slow viewing down, that are the intricacies that prolong the narrative and puncture the traditionally elevated uh, tone of the epic form. And finally, I want to say something about the conditions of display, this flow through the wall architecture of the museum. To recall again the fact that while Zoe Leonard uses photography and the work is mediated through a history of photographic representation, clearly, Al Rio also invokes conceptual models such as Hannah Darbovens, uh, the German conceptual artist whom I mentioned earlier, not least in the way the serial accumulation of images has the effect of making one lose oneself in the project, um, exacerbated in this e extraordinary installation here where you have the two distinct parts doubling, in a way, the space and doubling um, or mirroring. So one feels as if one kind of gets lost in the abyss between them. The relationship in Darboven's work between a sea of numbers, a sea of found photographs, these multiple temporal structures overlaid one upon the other, that's very much Darboven's terrain. And although in a way the accretion, you know, there's much more, there's much more loaded into one of Darboven's installation, I think the, this is the installation of her cultural history show at, at Dia uh, Beacon, um, no, it was in Chelsea, wasn't it, in 2017. But this is a work from the 1980s um, that consisted of 1,500 framed works on paper as well as sculptural object, a work that is both autobiographical as well as a history of post-war Germany. And although there's so much more accumulated in a Darboven installation, I think that effect of excess is, in a way, something that resonates with Zoe Leonard's project here. Also, I'm thinking of Onkawara, the Japanese-American artist, conceptual artist. This is just a wall section of his date paintings, um, also at Dia Beacon. So Onkawara produced over 4,000 date paintings over the course of his lifetime. And the works arranged in a sequence, although not necessarily in date order, 
or their different ways of grouping these today program, uh, paintings together in small parts or as far as possible in its entirety. Onkawara painted these small monochromes and he painted the date on which he painted it. If he didn't complete the painting, he chucked it, right? He didn't produce one every day of his life. There were intervals, but the project has that sense of kind of massive longevity. Um, Aria, of course, is striking for its lack of dates, as I said earlier, its lack of titles, its lack of place names, except insofar as they occur in the image itself. So all the trappings of documentary... Um, photography that had certainly been the lifeblood of the um, FSA project of the 1930s. Or, you know, here what you have with Onkawara is all that remains, in a way, the date is all that remains of history painting or the history of painting. You know, all that's left is the date on which it's made. Um, but even though there are these differences, there's something about the framing of Zoe Leonard's work that seems to me to be rooted in these seminal conceptual artists' works that both began to work serially in the 1960s. And they're both, uh, Darboven and Kawara, on Kawara, of course, conceptual artists who address the matter of time using complex strategies of expansion and reduction. So the sheer scale of Al Rio is a kind of charting or mapping of a journey, which itself contains her labor over many years, not only of shooting the images, but then editing them down into the 500 or so that end up in the final work or as the work. So I suppose we could say that this is an artwork in the long form, um, an epic form for now, um, rather than one which is nostalgic for epics of the past. And for Zoe Leonard, I think photography offers her a method of seeing that corresponds most closely with the epic form, not as an elevated genre, but rather because of several key features, the sheer geographical scope, as well as the time scale, of the journey trope that can span very extensive um, periods of time. Um, the complex and intricate adjustments that break down the overarching narrative into smaller passages and episodes. These are all key elements, I think, of the way she approaches narrative. And the journey time of the work that we follow is we follow the course of the river, the Rio Grande, from prologue to coda, is of course a fiction. Even at its most literal, the journey made up of these was in fact made up of numerous small journeys in which Zoe Leonard concentrated on different segments of the river over a long period of time and not necessarily in the right order. The schema is a given in the sense that there's a main flow of the narrative, but it's constantly being broken up by deviations and distractions. And the river, anyhow, has two banks. So it's a narrative that also already has two sides to it, and in actuality, more, many more, as the series proceeds. So the action of the river unfolds against many different landscapes and geographies. And the schematic construction, as I've suggested, could be described by the term chronotope. Maybe it's not that important, but it's an interesting term that was introduced by the Russian theorist Bakhtin. He developed it in the 1930s again, but now in the Soviet Union. It's recently been taken up by... Um, art historians Huey Thompson and Krista Thompson, uh, Huey Thompson, Huey Copeland and Krista Thompson, who are thinking about the recurrent 
iconographical um, motif in their reformulation of a black aesthetics. But in Zoe Leonard's project, I think the chronotope takes an epic form. It takes aspects from the literary epic, as I've noted, maintaining in particular a degree of abstractness or distance, which for Bakhtine was actually always integral to what he saw as the epic mode. He thought the epic mode always had to contain a kind of boundary. Um, he says, this boundary consequently is imminent in the form of the epic itself and is felt and heard in every word. To destroy this boundary is to destroy the form of the epic as a genre. I think what he means by that is a certain kind of distance, a certain kind of resistance to empathy in the epic form, as if this, a certain kind of distance has to be built in, it has to be necessary to sense rather than see the scale. And I think Zoe Leonard's work can be situated then not only as a representation of the border, but also as an exploration of these kinds of intersecting relationships. She tests out all the time her own epic mode that both invokes and counters that model of expeditionary photography that I showed you and explores this ground, this crucial ground between the historical survey and contemporary surveillance. Even the word explore that I find myself using um, or exploratory, of course, derives from earlier uses of the words expeditions, explorations, mapping and documenting the land, as well as at the same time settling it, displacing peoples, colonizing it. But the story of the river doesn't measure in a few hundred years, of course, but in millennia. So that question of how to measure its course hovers over it as a question throughout Leonard's project. One measure, one measure though, um, not the only measure, of course, but the one that I want to end with, which I think we should not lose sight of, is the measure of the viewer, or more precisely of the viewer's body, ours, as we move around through the work in a kind of stop, start, perambulation through the installation. The questions proliferate over the multiple viewpoints, this striking and emphatic shift between the images that show the river receding um, perspectively into the distance and the ones that block vision where a fence or a wall or a bridge or a field of cows place a metaphorical kind of keep out sign on the possibility of our seeing beyond it, let alone moving through it. This is a to and fro, I think, between the possible and the impossible of movement and impasse that become a function not only of politics, and of geography, but of vision itself. Thank you. I don't know if there, are, uh, there is any questions in the audience. Maybe I can start. Um, I would be happy if you could talk a little bit, little bit more about um, 
how you see the sequences of images in the work. For me, it's a quite new development in the work of, uh, of Zoe. And I know that you worked a lot about, mm. uh, uh, you thought a lot about uh, seriality mm. uh, in your previous uh, research. Mm. Maybe you could talk about that. Uh, mm. I mean, one of the things that really struck me when I, looking at the exhibition itself and how strong the short series are, how important they are, and my own collation of images for, the, for this talk where I sort of wanting to show you this kind of panoramic range and scope of the project had kind of drawn images from here and there and not just concentrated in these really tight little sequences. Um, one particular mini sequence or mini series that struck me that could be seen as a you know exemplary serial progression in some ways was not so much the one of the bridges but the one of the birds and the horizon where I only have two of them but if you look you can see that the height of the horizon is st staggers down, you know, in a serial progression, in some ways a quite explicit reference to certain, you know, modalities of, of seriality that are just as historically grounded as I would, as the, you know, photographs of Timothy O'Sullivan uh, kind of grounding a certain kind of landscape photography. And so I think that is definitely there in the work. And I, it's interesting, I wouldn't see it necessarily as a new development because I definitely associate that serial method with Zoe Leonard's work, partly because I suppose photography itself is serial, you know, in a sense. It necessarily works through repetition or you know, through a series of photographs. Um, the mechanical process of photography has been seen to be serial. Um, I think what comes out for me very strongly and what she makes very vivid or perhaps dramatizes about a serial method or how series work, these groups of images, is how much they're actually to do not with a progression, but with how much has to be taken out in the process. And in the installation that you have here, I think, as I understand it, she took a lot of work out. But I think we can absolutely understand that editing process of, of how a work becomes a work is as much to do with what is taken out of it as what's put into it. And it seemed to me that what she really drew my attention to, or made me think about, was how much series depend not on accumulation, but on the removal, <laughs> you know, to, to really prune, to really edit, to really make a series that's so spare. Um, and there are often groups of four or five or more, aren't they, that provide a very... Um, there's definitely a rhythm. It's almost... Um, I mean, it's so complicated, I think, as we loop back through... You know, we're moving through, but then we'll notice there's the, the use of repetition, which, of course, is a function of seriality. But then a new detail will emerge, and, you know, that patrol car will emerge within a series or be displaced. And I think she's using so many different perspectives and ways of shooting this, her, her kind of scenography, it seems to me, you know, but you often have a very similar scene, but obviously the, 
the dogs will be in a slightly different position. So there are mini stories in one sense, but you know, stories without a story in effect. How could we really know? Or very m memorable, I think, is the bathing sequence of the Mexican families that take the cars down to the, you know, that the banks of that very urbanized section of the river. But there's this kind of informality of the way these bodies of the children are, you know, swimming. And so that sense of the groups, these mini sequences that she has being necessary to encapsulate, I think, not anthologize this panorama, um, but create these different rhythms, sometimes concerned very much with the ordinary, the mundane aspects of life. I think there's something very deflationary about it. Because when you have four or five images that are very similar and kind of string, at, you know, they stretch out the horizon through repetition in effect, you really have this, you know, you, you absolutely refuse that sort of elevated tone, I think. So I think it has to do with the movement, the discontinuities, the rhythms of this flow that is necessarily broken and I think that for that in order for her to maintain that and keep that drive within the work this approach to seriality is sort of fundamental to what she does you could see sometimes a sort of Judd stack you know or some you know Smith's and staggering forms you know there's a level of a of abstraction that's really intense, isn't there? Some uh, ten years ago, you wrote a, an essay uh, about the, the work of Zoe Leonard. It was for her show at the Camden, Camden Art Center. About what? Uh, ten years ago, you, you wrote this text uh, about Zoe, Zoe, Zoe Leonard, uh, about her show at the Camden Art Center. Sorry, I so, just didn't, I'm not following. I think it's my four o'clock no, I want to maybe yeah, uh, you ask you to, if you could um, um, make some connections between um, this project and another project, uh, our Camera Obscura work ah. at the, that we, she presented 10 years ago at the Camden Art Center, mm. which was also about landscape. Mm. Uh, maybe I was about, thinking uh, about that. No, I'm, I'm not sure whether people... Uh, if, this series, a number of uh, camera obscuras that she has made, including one, I believe, at Marfa that I never saw, yes. So, I mean, I'm not sure I can answer it in a... Um, I was, I think in a way, it certainly has to do with the historicity of photography and always insisting on the histories of photography. It's kind of photography's own self-referential origin stories. Um, but I think also this sense that she's done several, so the use of repetition in the work, you know, you can see those as individual artworks, but you can also see them as a body of work. You could put them all together so that sense between the, you know, the difference between the sing singular and the multiple, I think that's very much something that's going on here as well. But there's something about a camera obscura, of course, that captures in this very strange 360 degree space, or you know, this sense of being surrounded by the um, projected image that I think for me it just, you know, this, this preoccupation with shaping or form making that here the key driver is horizontality 
There's something very self-mimicking about it, whereas in a camera obscura, of course, you're making a very... You're sculpting space in a very different way and using photography in a way to create this total environment. And I think through exploring the different possibilities of photography and its history, she's exploring different ways of form making, different ways of envisaging the world or representing the world to us, I think. I also made the connection with this uh, notion of a chronotop that you mm. developed. These artworks are really very much about uh, time and space, of course. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know if there is any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really lovely um, to hear you give us these descriptions. Uh, I want to ask you about some images that you showed at the beginning. That you called them the Coda works. Um, I'm, I'm very curious about how you situate these works within what you've described as the epic or the narrative of the entire body, uh, particularly because in my sort of naive reaction to the works as a whole, it, those moments where we see the bodies moving across what I believe is a bridge um, really kind of corrupts this horizontality that you've described mm. as sort of the modus um, that Leonard works through. So I, I'm, I'm very curious about how you read these within the narrative of the piece as a whole, mm. or perhaps if there's any sort of precedent in Leonard's work um, for this kind of moment of scale shift or even a temporal shift that seems mm. to happen with these parts of the work. The coda where she's using this footage that she discovered, the kind of shocking um, surveillance footage that she accesses and then photographs on her own computer screen on an iPhone. I, for me, I, I felt they were very much a way of, uh, I don't really want to say breaking the fiction because I think they're as intensely part of it as any other part of the the work but I think there's definitely this sense, sense that she doesn't want to end she certainly doesn't want to end with the with the with the with the waves on the beach does she you how would you end this I mean I think part of her approach to the project is something about a project never really being completed. Yeah? So I think, you know, how to bring the work to a close is something that she, there might have been many different alternatives that she might have pursued or thought about. I mean, this seemed to me to end with a sort of a shock almost, a shock that, that, that such surveillance, perhaps this is naive in a way, but that such surveillance could be accessed, could be shown to us in this way, you know. And the shock also that she's clearly avoided, or there's very little... Um, figurative presence. There are little figures and they're often, as she herself made very clear, they're, they're in the distance because she doesn't want to reveal who these people are. They may be there, as she said, I think, in that conversation with Suzanne Cotter, you know, they may be there for many reasons that she, you know, does not want to reveal. But then you suddenly have these figures, don't you, that are in a totally different kind of tone and modality and, of course, in colour again. As I said, I saw it almost echoing the the kind of, you know, the patterns of circulation in the, 
in the prologue. But perhaps that's, in some ways, it's the divergence and the clarity of the surveillance process that is important there. You know, it, it's in a way the, the rawness of that, that not raw in the sense that it's immediate, it's far from it. I mean, it's kind of doubly, triply mediated, isn't it, through the various screens. But there's something of that kind of shock that makes it clear the politics of this piece, I think, in a way. Um, there's no doubt about how... There's something... Going through it, you, you veer from these astonishingly beautiful photographs to something much more like the terror. And I think it's almost the mundane way in which people are just kind of going about their lives in the, that final coda, isn't it? You know, they're just going about their business. But here they are, you know, kind of on... Uh, captured on these, the, these surveillance cameras. So I... You know, I, I think in a way it's a very strong end. But I think in a way, photographically, the project belongs elsewhere. You know, I mean, I think aesthetically it belongs elsewhere. Hmm. Any other question? Time to thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. And for those questions, thank you.